É, boa Alexandre. tarde a todos. Queria agradecer a SBGC por este evento maravilhoso. Boa tarde a todos. Eu gostaria de agradecer a SBGC por este evento de transformação digital, nossa parceria com o UD9. Nós estamos tomando every precaution. Right, doctor? I would like to thank Felipe and Denisa, Glossa Interpreters, and because they are helping us here. Our panel is about digital transformation in the many sectors. And I would like to thank our guests that came here to share their experiences, their challenge in their profession. First, Leonardo Brandi Leone, Matos Filhos Lawyers, which is the Director in Technology and Knowledge. Soraya Dalcol from Sirio Libanese Hospital, which is an intensive doctor, and she's responsible for the redis residencies. Felipe Pacheco here from the University, Uninove. Eu estou tendo um problema. O intérprete é, deu uma travada na imagem, não está saindo o som. Então, não estou interpretando por isso. There's no sound. We had a break in our live. transformação digital. Durante o painel, queremos obter resposta a algumas questões aí sobre transformação digital. A rotina do trabalho que mudou, como os clientes e os cidadãos se beneficiaram dessas tecnologias digitais, como estão sendo os nossos desafios no dia a dia, o que fica, o que não fica nesse novo mundo, e de onde vêm esses recursos, de onde vêm essas iniciativas, de onde vêm as tomadas de decisões para os investimentos em gestão do conhecimento, inovação e novas tecnologias. É, agora, para vocês entenderem um pouquinho o que nós vamos abordar, nós vamos passar um vídeo sobre o desafio da transformação digital. Espero que gostem, que tem muito a ver com o nosso tema de hoje. It. Let, let's see it. The interpreter is not interpreting because the video is not going on. I think it's going to start in any moment. There's no video. I'm waiting. E agora eles só estão eles só estão vendo o vídeo agora lá.
É, esse vídeo é bem um exemplo de como mostrar que nós vídeo é um exemplo de como nossas vidas estão conectadas a tudo, nossos carros. E agora vamos falar com o Leonardo Brandi Leone, ele vai falar sobre a sua experiência. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank for the invite, the opportunity to be here. I'm going to present our offices. For the ones who don't know us, we are one of the main offices here in the Latin America. We are a solution hub for our client. We have legal services for the client development. We have full service action. We work with every areas in law, criminal, anything. And we are 28 years old. We are a new and very innovative office. We have 1,300 professional, 600 lawyers, and now 108 partners. Our Managing area has 500 professionals, four boards, communication and marketing, urban development, finance and operations, and the board where I am, which is knowledge technology. And we have many professionals there. Contextualizing us, we believe knowledge and Technology Board has a super important and relevant role regarding information. We work in digital transformation, especially in knowledge management by optimizing our processes because our firm generates knowledge internally and externally with our clients as well. So it's very important that we manage knowledge and pro pro projects in this sense, so that we are more effective and productive to our firm and for our customers, for our clients, I mean. Now we would like to introduce Soraya Dalcol from Sirio Libanese Hospital. She's going to talk about her experience in the health scenario. Hello, I would like to thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to be here with SBGC, where I learned a little bit about KM. I have graduated last year. I am a doctor in Sirio Libanese Hospital, which is a philanthropist <clears throat> organization whose pillars are not limited to health, but also in education. And also social work. I work in the intensive care unit. I work with the Reali Realista program. I manage law knowledge with SBGC. I have operational degree also. Yeah, I am a facilitator. I'm, there is no interest conflict. I would talk about the KM practices in the eye intensive care unit. We have a, a multi visitation in ICU that involves every professional that works there: physical therapy, nutritional, nutrition, psychology. It is a daily round where we share information and we define plans and goals on how to take care of the patients. We have 
to maximize information, to have our practices standardized, and we have to share knowledge so that the main, our main focus is taking care of the patient. All of this information is registered in our electronic chart, which is uh, which grants access to everyone inside our, our hospital, and the doctors can access from their from outside the hospital, with some exceptions. Last year, I idealized the family participation project in the ICU because we would like to insert the family of the patients in the care of the patient. We have to become the information more effective between our staff and the patients. And we have to reduce the anxiety in the patient family. It seems to be something obvious, but I have to mention ICU is like a battle war, a, a war field. We have to reach our objective. We have to have families and patients more secure and to have a better relationship between everyone and the care of our patients and their families. This project happened last year and we received awards honor awards with the hospital we received honorable mentions and we had basic premises we analyzed critically we prioritized knowledge and expectations all of these happened in common with the organization because we search value and health. Value and health is a Porter equation derivative where pertinence is important. We have closure and experience and waste. So we have what's pertinent. We have to reach a better outcome, promoting the, what's best for the patient with the least of waste. And we have also triple aim, which is based in populational <clears throat> adequate with care, with low cost. So we have to take care of the family, of the professional, of the patient, and we have to take care who is being taken care of and who is taking care of the patient. And talking about digital revolution in medicine, our great leap in this pandemic was validate telemedicine in Brazil, which is a very beautiful project and very important, which our, our hospital is involved in other four hospitals, Einstein, Age Core, Osvaldo Cruz Institution, which is have telemedicine in ICU. There are lots of ICUs in Brazil, and we are going to bring our expertise and our experience for uh, from what we have been learning this pandemic to everywhere, which was very impressive in, for everyone who participated. I'm not going to have cases because of time constriction, but there is a disparity between ICU care in great centers, in private hospitals, and the reality of smaller hospitals and smaller cities. More important, it's the disposition of people in learning and how they want to take care of their patients the best way possible. So it's a uh, a fantastic opportunity to share knowledge. And how do we know if we have good results in this pandemic? A news report in May overwhelmed people because in Brazil, one in each three patients with COVID live from the patients who have been intubated. So this data have come from a private platform, I'm not going to say which one, but it collects data 
from about 450 hospitals in a total of 951 ICU and thousands of beds. There are patients in ICU in general, but they have a special way only for COVID patients and the discrepancy between private and public hospitals, it's enormous. The UCI with patients in ventilators is almost 70%. <clears throat> and this allowed us to compare our performance. And we could pay attention what's different between both places. Technology and data integration, data information allows us go further to see what's best. I think this is it. Thank you so much. Okay, Uninov is going to talk about the scene, about technologies used to transfer knowledge. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank the partnership. I hope everyone likes it. I want to talk about KM. This is very important for us because we work with the final destination of knowledge. This is how we are going to deliver the product to our students. So we are a nonprofit institution and every money we have, we invest in our institution. We do not have shareholders. We are not public, but we have a public, specific public, which is the D class. And how do we manage knowledge? Our professors are capacitated, how they are capacitated and how they interact with the students and how are they going to be prepared for the market? And we are going to talk about it now. We would like to innovate our product, which is educate, education. And how can we innovate the product and how the company manages their, their staff and the professors and how can the professionals can support the teachers? So I have one slide here. And it, it is our motto, which is everywhere in here in our university. Our purpose is to have citizen professionals ethical and competent so that they can act in a work world critically and creatively also supported with scientific innovations and considering the work and the entrepreneurship in the regional national international context we are technology oriented and I am the, in the technology department, but we don't bring this only for the staff and the professor. We want to, to embrace the world. We know it's a difference when we have a employee that knows how to use Excel or, or the one who doesn't. And we know the ones that can be AKM and the other one that's not. So the one who can is our student, is, get, is the one who is going to get in touch with technologies. And we know all the tools that the market demands for the professional to be a good one. And in the pandemics, we have a partnership very strong. We are in their case, we are the university with the highest number of students. All of them have a Google Suite account. What does it mean? It means that it's, he's not only going to have an email, he has access granted to all apps. And all of our professors are enabled to use all of these apps, applications in the classroom. The student, every test they take is digitally. And when the pandemic started, this digital transformation was already a reality. 
and this is about our managerial things but te text correct test correction projects all of this is digital so our students didn't have any difficulties in going online all of them already had an email they did not have to have this we know digital transformation demands a lot because the stakeholders in the digital transformation they have to be capacitated and i already capacitated illiterate people and they knew how to take the tests so we have to bear this in mind that digital transformation is something that is present our students know english because they need to understand how they are going to log in the system and then we have our english courses free of charge for every student and there are our professors can have tests and google forms and they are capacitated to do it and the digital transformation department and this area is very important for us because we need to transform our students they need to be adequate in this de te digital technology so we are up in the, in the ranking of students and organizations and every principal has a common agenda which is eradicate hunger diseases and we have we need a, a very nice social impact and we do we have many scholarships a hundred percent free of charge and i am i had this scholarship program and we have even magical students who have these scholarships and we are the university who has the highest number of scholarships in medicine and we have postgraduate programs which are completely free of charge and this is our pride because we invest on these projects to help our society to help our students so that they are in the market field very well capacitated and ready for the real life so we are we take care of this tr digital transformation thank you so much and i thank sbgc again so now we're going to begin uh, our debate so I hope that I received questions from Telegram and your doubts as well. And please do not forget after our presentation, everything is going to be recorded and the video can be shared. So the link as well is going to be shared. So we're going to share it, okay? Khalil is far from here, but he sent us his presentation talking about his experience and the challenges he had to tackle. So after that, we can start the debate, all right? A cabine não tem acesso ao áudio. The booth doesn't have access to the audio. A cabine não tem acesso ao áudio, por isso é impossível a interpretação. It's impossible to interpret because I cannot hear the audio. So the pr a problem in the city was uh, people that lived on the streets. So we create an action called Pokemon Go that mobilized people that live on the streets 
in order to gather them and access to shelters. So we also created a system of bike counting with a combination perspective. It was, it was really cheap. I was invited by the University of Cambridge to present this system to them. There were lots of experts from more than 40 countries. And recently I have invested in this area, which I call academic automation, because I realized that a lot of activities that were manually made, they could be, uh, they could be done in a different way. They could be done automatically. So researcher had to measure manually the amount of contractions and by having an automation system, you can measure it much better. So you can have the amount of contractions as you can see in the video. Another usage is uh, identifying cells on the left. You can see that those uh, identif that identification was made manually. The researcher did this and on the right, you have a computational perspective. So a robot made that. We do have another usage, which has to do with urbanism and architecture. So the visualization of how the city has evolved in the last 25 years. So I have selected 80 lines and I created a routine in order to transform that into a chart. So as you can see, you have the evolution of the amount of houses. 22% the last 25 years, and the number of apartments more than doubled, and the number of land has reduced significantly. The amount of land has reduced significantly. So what about digital transformation? It has been happening since when? So let's have a bird's eye view of the issue. It has been happening for a long time. It has begun since the popularization of smartphones. So when people managed to connect themselves to the internet and have applications, so this is a revolution for sure. Let me give you an example. Before, before this evolution, we went to the bank. We had to walk and stand on lines. And now the bank is our, in our cell phone screen next to us. Before we used to go to a shop and buy tickets. And now those shops are close to us in our cell phones, such as banks and other applications and millions of other gadgets. Nowadays, Play Store has 3 million apps. And what do we get from this? The comfort that cell phones bring us that makes us on cell phones, right? This doesn't happen because of the pandemic. Before the pandemic, people were uh, used to being on the couch, right? So now what we do is to balance the, the amount of time they spend on couches. We imagine that we have cell phones, but in fact, cell phones have us. We are imprisoned by smartphones in my in my master thesis, I studied the connection between being a sedentary and apps. Oh, I created an application that invited people to, uh, that would invite them to go out. So when people install the application, they will be invited to go out and go to the streets and go back to the place that belonged to them in the past. So they would go to a park, for instance, maybe a Batman cave, Maybe you could go to Paraisopolis, doesn't matter, right? But the app invited you to move, move out your house. So to wrap up, so we have this question here. So what is the digital transformation that you want? This one here, where people can live with nature. Or this one here. Thank you very much. Khalil, thank you very much for sharing this. Now you are live with us. And that's it. So you can share your perspectives on Instagram. So what this show transformation want for your lives? Maybe you do not want to change, right? Maybe you do not want technology. 
So we are entitled to choose. Now we're going to start with the questions. So our lovely guests can turn on their microphones. Khalil is invited to participate. So the protagonists in organizations. So where do initiatives come from? Top down, isolated, sectorial? Are they committees? Who are those people that take the initiatives? Are they creative? Are they forced to make those decisions, those changes? in performing a new kind of management in your companies? Who are the protagonists and how is this done? Bottom up, top down, isolated, like a riot. So could you please tell us a bit more about that? So how do you see that change? Where does it come from? Can you start? Yeah, sure, I can begin. So from everywhere. There are initiatives that are top down, of course. but managers have a crucial role. They have a crucial role in understanding the necessity of the people that are on one end. Sometimes it's bottom up, sometimes it's top down. So in fact, we are interested in the necessity that comes from the people, so it's bottom up, right? So the company wants to know the changes that are happening. So this quality award that the hospital has been granted. It is an initiative that we have in order to encourage people to reflect upon this, to think outside the box. We have many initiatives connected to KM in all the institution, but not with that name, a KM department per se, but with the same purpose. Nursery has this a uh, KM initiative in a more consolidated fashion. So Nursir wants to have, uh, wants to be awarded with a special award, right? And this, of course, contaminates other people. We have people encouraging people. So it has a change in culture. So, and when you mention culture, the culture of people, sometimes you cannot change, right? Yes. I. Many initiatives come from needs. Maybe the person cannot understand the context, but the person realizes the necessity to generate a uh, procedure. So in Matos video, how does that happen? So our office is innovative. It is in our DNA. So when we talk about digital transformation, we talk about, we have been talking about this for a long time. So in our office, we give people autonomy as Soraya has just mentioned, we have some top-down changes, of course, maybe a new regulation, maybe a new need that the customer wants, of course. But of course, we have uh, we encourage people to look at their boards, at their sectors, lawyers themselves. We encourage lawyers to bring this uh, innovative, this entrepreneur DNA that could make us better in the future. So nothing is centralized. So we work in a decentralized way because we want to bring innovation that of course can add value to the, to the customer. That's how we work in the customer. So maybe of course, even in an office, you are multidisciplinary, right? Have different sectors in the office. Is that true? Yes, it is. So I mentioned something interesting. Sometimes people uh, work with KM, but they do not use that name. Maybe they use another name. They do not call innovation by innovation. So KM is a complex label, right? But we know that KM is everywhere. It's pervasive. You cannot have innovation without knowledge. I usually say that knowledge is uh, is always in action, right? So Felipe, could you please compliment on that? I would say that our innovative DNA uh, is connected to the student. So I would say that a successful university has professors and students that are engaged. So when you have this and those people are heard, so it's easy, right? So we listen to the students and they get together with a professor so we can deal with this, which is uh, innovative center promoting creation of ideas. 
So we have been analyzing our students and we have understood something that students in general, they are uh, motivated, right? But then at the same time, we have a student from computation, computational science, right? And this student wants to do something in medicine. Okay, so first things first. So what is the problem you want to solve? Oh, I want to work with uh, artificial intelligence. Okay, but then you get the same student, a student that studies medicine, and then he asks you, I want to work with artificial intelligence connected to medicine. Well, what problem do you want to solve? No, I don't know. I, I like this area. So I, I wouldn't say that this, uh, problems are specific to our university, but it's something general, right? In academia that we bring science and we just talk about academia and science. Sometimes I forget the practical terms. Uh, we forget that student has to solve a problem in the market. So the students cannot uh, realize the problems he or she has to tackle in the market, right? Uh, so we have to think about the final customer. So that's why we have come up with startups, connecting people that know how to do and people that have ideas. So maybe a student that cannot program, right, that does not know how to program, so can connect people. For instance, a student that knows how, knows how to do it. So we can connect those people. So we can merge those ends. So in fact, you're connecting the dots. So I'm not here motivating people. They were already motivated, but they did not know how to do it. So it's, that's KM, right? So in terms of KM innovation, we do our part. We innovate ourselves and we bring innovation to students. We talk about KM to students, but of course, we I, I would say that the biggest in, uh, innovation we have is students that bring us ideas and we just validate and we provide the resources and the, the plant grows the tree grows and i would say that that's really important right digital transformation is really important the agile methodology is of utmost importance it connects needs to solutions so it's it's easier to see that so nowadays uh Kalil mentioned that people are uh imprisoned by technology right and we know that young people are they want instantaneous uh, answers, right? So I think it's tough for you, for Soraya, for all of you to select those students. Nowadays, people are struggling when they have conflicts, right? Khalil, could you please tell us a bit of your experience about young people uh, in your experience, how are those pieces selected, the qualities of those people? Could you, could you tell us about it? So, Felipe mentioned something interesting. Let me comment on that. Some people arrived with a solution for a problem. And then I tried to explain that we had lots of problems. So instead of creating something and then trying to push that thing that he or she thinks it's useful, the idea as it would be to spend some time analyzing the problem and then presenting a proposal for a solution. So this immediacy that uh, students have is a big issue that I have experienced. We know that everything depends on smart, uh, smartphones, right? They want immediate answers, so they don't have time to dedicate themselves to analyzing a problem. Let me give an example. And it's rather paradoxical because they watch Netflix for many, many hours, for 48 hours in the weekend, and at the same time, they cannot spend 15 minutes analyzing a problem. So that's a paradox. So I struggled in dealing with this characteristic, especially with young people. And of course, I struggled dealing with older people, especially from the town hall. Because for those people, they did not understand what knowledge was. They did, uh, didn't want to divulge that knowledge. So that's what, where KM uh, could be applied. So we could take advantage of the accumulated knowledge that is, has been there for 30, 40 years. But there was a firewall in people, right, that prevented us from doing so. So we didn't have an interface right? Uh, youngsters did not want to know what the older ones did, and the older employees uh, uh, saw the younger ones as a threat, so it was tough. 
Yes, I can imagine that. So now let's talk about digital transformation in sectors. So what uh, has been innovated in your routines? So uh, of course we are talking about diverse sectors, but what has changed in customers and citizens? So what are they benef benefiting from in terms of digital transformation, especially nowadays in this chaotic situation? How do you see such transformation? Maybe I could talk about my uh, area, my expertise. I would say it brought lots of benefits. First things first, it has uh, lots of things that were demystified. So by having web conferences and virtual meetings, right? And people imagine that this wouldn't work. So it was proved wrong. So this uh, made life faster. I think that people are working more now than before. Meetings are happening on time, no delays. I would say communication is more dynamic and faster. So this was a huge gain. There was a gain as well, an interface with laws, right? With the law. So we have courts and trials happening virtually. So I, I would say that uh, for the client, for the customer, this he, can, he or she can save time. I would say concerning events and talking about meetings, advertisement, I would say that because of technology, so places ha are shorter now. So people from different places can be together. So there's no more, there are no more geographical limits. So it was really positive. This has brought lots of gains. And those gains mainly for lawyers, right? Because lawyers use lots of paper. Yeah, so we write lots of things. So we don't have that anymore in offices. So we don't have so much paper, right? In printing copies, so on and so forth. So everything now is digital. So you can send an email, a WhatsApp message. So collaboration has improved a lot. So you can exchange information with the customer. Yeah, because many times KM does not only depend on technology, but depends on communication, understanding what the other person said. So, and digital, digital transformation helps with sustainability. As you mentioned, paper. So, uh, yeah, and people also complain, always complained about uh, the bureaucracy, the red tape. Has this changed? I believe so. I believe so. I think it has changed. Uh, maybe people would not believe that uh, on that. I would say that law firms are really traditional, but I think it's a trend that is here to stay. So when we have courts and trials, so they are faster now. Soraya, in your area, what has changed uh, in your customer, with your customer and professionals that provide health services? I would say that in a general way, when we talk about health and telemedicine, it is really important. It is a long debate talking about telemedicine and the relationship between doctors and, and patients. There are lots of but there are lots of risks. Sometimes doctors have to touch the patient, so that's an issue. But I would say that telemedicine, intensive care units, when we have physicians talking to physicians, this has helped a lot. It, it broke frontiers. It was a breakthrough. In theory, uh, in practice, it's not so beautiful, right, as it is in theory. So a, a, a huge cultural change has happened. But we had positive results. Because of the pandemic, uh, the routine of the uh, intensive care units has changed. So we have gone a step back. So I, I read a book talking about the plague and people were abandoned uh, by their relatives. And this happened. This happened nowadays and happened in the past. So we had to, we wouldn't allow patients uh, to be close to relatives because of their relatives' safety. So we had, we had to reduce the amount of people in the intensive care units. And technology made us uh, uh, patients and relatives a bit closer, right? So we have those televisits where, uh, where psychologists promote 
conferences using a tablet, even patients that are intubated for uh, relatives to see what's happening with the patient in some intensive care units, the relatives don't have access to those places in, in hours and uh, we, it can be done, but it's a very short time. So by using this technology, we were able to bring the relative a bit closer to the patient. But at the same time, technology makes us a, a bit further from each other. So that's why we have to be careful, as Khalil just mentioned. When we share information, it is really important, of course, especially medicine. And because of the pandemic, things have been happening so fast. So knowing what was happening in other places of the world was really important to us. So sharing our experience with other unit centers, health unit centers, health unit centers that do things properly. By doing this, it was really important. But concerning medicine, fake news uh, were really bad to us. So it's really bad for us not having the truth, right? But we are working properly and we are strong in this struggle. Unfortunately, because sometimes we are immediate. People do not research. They want to share things and do not research. They do not look for the information to see if it is fake or not. So you can talk about the difficulties, but what is the good side of it? We have had lots of problems, this is for sure. And this is the paper problem that you were talking about in the sec secretaries, we, we have it too. We have a problem, the students who are going to have an internship, they need to bring the documents in paper. And then we asked, is it really necessary? Couldn't we validate it digitally with the company? So the students are there in person. Do we really need this amount of paper? Why do we need to hand in in person? Couldn't we scan the documents? So when we file in sec secretary, uh, people imagine working in person and we had to go digital. Even the connection with the anatomy lab, it had to be asynchronous. The person can't access it later why do don't we why can't we have a digital lab we can scan the exams the images and the students can access it later the student can study anywhere in an asynchronous ma manner is it really necessary we have to analyze do we need to be in the lab to to check the dissected heart can't we take pictures and the student access it remotely and the teeth in a dentist the odontology course can't we do it in a three-dimensionally and on our website, the production courses, can't we have uh, remote access so, can, so that the student can access the university computer remotely from their houses? So we started analyzing everything. So many things we didn't do because it wasn't that important. Some physical spaces that it was important to be there. Okay, what wasn't important? So our professor know how to use the tools. And I always say, we have to work hard all the time people have to be trained 
I went to a conference and people there thought we were crazy. To have training G Suite and these online tools, they, they thought we were crazy people. Why have so many classes, so many training? And I said, we are going to need it. And now when the pandemic is over, we are going to use this change. And it's going to be much better when we broke our frontiers, when we change other protocols. Yes, this is extra competencies for the professionals and for the students, right? Khalil, you, are you there? You have worked a lot with government, with the county. What is the good thing for the citizens? Well, I think the main thing, there are lots of tasks that can be done from home remotely, and they you didn't use to do it remotely. So all that fear the government have to allow the workers to work from home, now it disappeared because they could see, well, they are still afraid, but they had to adjust to the situation. And then we have more productivity in some areas. And this was very beneficial. Can you imagine in Sao Paulo to commute from home to their work? People can have a much better life now because they do not need to go, go out their homes to work. There are people that gained four extra hours in their day, and they can work better, they can be in a better mood. And then they can work from home, depending on the person's job. And from the citizens, there was a boom in the digital services that they weren't implemented. I joke, the stamp syndrome, the people need docu needed documents to get stamped. Now everything is digital. Even the driver's license, for instance, now we can do it remotely. There, there was no why in going in the place. This would happen sooner or later. But the pandemic speeded up this process. It wasn't the mayor, the CEO of any companies. It was the coronavirus that pushed people to go digital. This pandemic is the responsible one from the digital transformation that we have been witnessing. And you at home, who are our protagonists in our conference, you can talk about it. Do you think that this digital approach is transforming people? What are the principles of a transformation of the society? As he said, we knew many things needed to be changed, but this pandemic ended up speeding up everything. What is the benefits? for this transformation for you. Do you think people should be transformed as well? Yes. Shifting culture means that people have to change. This is the basis. The institutions have to be aware. And the role of the leadership in promoting people, uh, making people aware of their change. They need to change. The pandemic showed that our actions are based in our needs and people need to get convinced of the importance of it. Yeah, sure. I think the digital transformation has to be discussed. People think the professionals will be replaced by, by machines, computers, or any tools. 
these tools and machines they are going to aid the professional to do their jobs not to replace them we are not one is not going to replace the other but together they are going to be stronger the machine the tool is not to replace the human brain but it's only going to enhance the capacity people who are capacitated will make a difference someone that has never seen a digital sheet they only saw it on paper maybe these ones will be replaced for another human being who knows how to use the tools but these people that could be replaced they not uh, they are not less less than the others but they should be capacitated and this is only one of the many examples that we can so digital transformation is for everyone Okay, Kalil, can you say something else? Uh, yes, aqui. it is very important to highlight. There's been value inversion. We used to think of some things that were important and how with the pandemic that our lives could be shortened things have changed radically me for instance i used to travel a lot i would like to have a beach house on a greek island now after soraya's presentation my dream is have a bed on icu <laughs> so uh, it was a paradigm shift i had a cha uh, change in my dream Leonardo told us about the new competencies that we are promoting and the collaborators have to be trained. How is this trajectory in your form? Yes, connecting to the previous question, digital transformation and all their processes require new competencies. There's no way to talk about training and capacitation without new realities. COVID has helped uh, on this change. People who couldn't adapt are suffering. So, you know, in our case, we know firms that weren't technologically prepared and not only technology, but people's competencies to use this technology. They had lots of problems. And still talking about cultures, we are still trying to realize this new normal. How is it going to be? This new mindset, the skill mindset, how can we change? How can, I mean, how can we respond rapidly to change? How can we correct the way we, we do? And people's management also. We need to develop new competencies and we do not want to repeat what we had. We need to look forward and we have to develop our new competencies, the new way of work, and this, we, this can, has to be done fast. It can't be slow. And also technology, of course. It's very, very important. Yes, we have to simplify a little bit. Companies and organizations need to invest in technology. It's going to be expensive if they do not operate. We have to, to use technology and be prepared. OK, talking about people, there are subcultures in a company as well. And who is responsible for this? The workers, the managers, the KMers also. So these new technologies in the digital transformation, there is also the creativity. Creativity is the differential, the will to learn. This is going to assure everyone's spaces in the working field. So 
talking about KM, it has to have a facilitating environment. People are insecure to share because they think the knowledge is theirs. The strategy of the business. How do you use this knowledge transfer? How can we register it? How is it done? This relevant knowledge, how is it done? In your scenario. So I think that the biggest challenge concerning KM is convincing people that sharing knowledge is multiplying knowledge. In the medical field, this is particularly difficult because when we talk about phys physicians, we have reference physicians. And I would say that those reference physicians have convinced themselves that they have to multiply their knowledge. This cannot stop. This has to flow. In the hospital, since we work with students from different backgrounds, different areas, we encourage professionals that are there, physicians and other professionals, professionals, uh, and we want to convince them that they are responsible for their education. So it's not only a university environment as Uninovi, but I would say that the students wish to learn more makes the professionals engaged. So students want to tease us, to poke us in a certain way. So we were talking about generation, right? Yeah. Do you remember the, the Mundo VUCA, the VUCA world, which means vulnerable, anxious, and certain world? So let, let's make a connection between something that Thiago Forte mentioned, mentioned, the fear of missing out, FOMO. So what is that? We have lots of information that is flowing, right? So it's tough to identify what is important or not. So we are struggling a bit with using the right app or the right technology and prioritize what is going to make the difference or not. When it comes to uh, educating our professionals, we have been using different platforms, sharing platforms in order to facilitate this process, in order to make information available real time. So that information is not only in the person or depending on a specific person that can help me, but that this information could be easily accessed. Let me just say something based on that. When we talk about technology, which is um, not my area, I totally uh, see eye to eye with you, what Soraya mentioned. It, it's fine to find a kind of technology that is mature enough that allows us to share information, right? Yeah, let me talk about my case, my office. So we have our electronic managing system that manages thousands of documents, but its search is very small, very refined, in fact. So we have a specific number, a specific customer, but you cannot perform a more dynamic search. Let's imagine the lawyer wants to find a specific point about a specific case in a, in a specific legal case. So it's tough for a lawyer to find this information. So I can understand what lawyers feel, right? So because of this uh, artificial intelligence, robots, and the digital transformation, now those things are able to understand what this document is. And once this is done, the process of indexation happens in a much better way. So when you share knowledge, uh, uh, it, it's really important. It shows how valuable that thing is. It is, it is an exchange between the people that are receiving the information and the ones that are sharing it. But we lack technology not to support that. Khalil, do you have something to say? Uh, I agree with what you said. 
GP3, uh, GPT-3 has been recently launched. It is a, a, a program that does what was mentioned. So it can read texts and produce texts from information. It has 170 million pieces of information of documents. So it's a matter of time, right? It's going to be better. It's not going to replace the human being, but a tool to aid people. It's a matter of time, right? And we're going to realize that we will have to do less of some of, of a specific task as uh, the lawyer has mentioned, right? In the Matos Filio case. And we'll have time to perform deeper analysis. There's going to be a migration. We're going to have people that are able to perform an analysis a deeper analysis because the basic steps are going to be covered by technology. So let me just make a comment. So when we talk about digital transformation and automation of activities, pe people uh, imagine that uh, other people are going to be idle. They're going to watch more movies, read more books. Mm. Let me share my perspective. You can share yours, of course. In my daily routine, uh, I, I've been doing many more things. It has tripled. So our productivity has increased, our work has increased, of course. And because technologies are connected to us, they are an extension of our, our body. So since we are working home-based, there's no time. Uh, we are always looking at smartphones and checking emails. So what is your routine? So because of technology, uh, this is a tough issue, right? So we are working much more. What about you? So let me just establish a link when we talk about remote teaching and learning. So we talk about remote classes, right? So we usually say that remote classes are more expensive than in-person courses. Because when you have in-person courses, the teachers and professors are teaching and can grab the student's attention. And he or she says what is should depending on what the student needs. But when you have uh, when you're working virtually, so it's tough to establish a connection. Uh, and you cannot guarantee that that content is not becoming is becoming knowledge. So we have different people, different places, right? And transforming that into knowledge. So this is not easy. So I have to reflect upon that. Let me just give an example. When we use tools, this conference was, it demanded lots of attention, right? Lots of time. So we have different issues. It was easier to give somebody a microphone and that's it, right? But when you have those remote conferences, right? By using technology, so in the past, when you have those gamers that, that do some live sessions, I know that uh, nowadays everybody wants to perform lives, right? And in the past, those, those people that played games and did live sessions, they got famous, right? But now we really need that. So a teacher, a professor that had in-person classes. So this person, the teacher, the professor has to be able to do this in a remote way. So the person has to have enough knowledge, but it demands lots of work, right? Living inertia is troublesome. Innovating is troublesome. So we also have, we always have different technology, different applications, different tools. So we have to research and compare apps. So this demands time and work is not something magical that happens uh, fast, right? It is not like an automatic vacuum cleaner that cleans the house, right? They are not that wonderful, okay? So it requires research, training. Uh, so we have to do this in order to make people understand and to have results. So if companies want to implement this procedure, for some people, they would think, so this can improve the process. For people, they would say this, it's more expensive. And nowadays, products and services, they sell the experience to the human being. So when you buy something, there was a questionnaire. So tell us about your experience. So people are getting critical about that. 
like they are criticizing that and of course uh these technologies are connected to to people and of course this uh won't happen in a matter of hours okay so can you tell me about your routine so we're not Gabriella's, right? I was born like this, and I'm going to be like that forever. No, no, we have to abandon this paradigm. So you have to be forced to change. It's not easy, right? It is an active process. It is not passive. So it can be pushed, but of course, you have to do it by yourself. Broadly, broadly speaking, because of the digital transformation, if you do not become aware that you have to change to improve, of course, uh, you're going to be ignored. So even had I said something interesting, one year ago, he said that the digital empire exists. It is a reality. Empires, dominating empires are digital and people that do not understand that, do not want to change, they are going to uh, they're going to be useless right of course we cannot generalize this depends from person to person maybe some people work in an analogic way Khalil mentioned his latin professor right but i would say that in general we have to evolve and we have to be aware of that and do this in a way that is not that painful right but with so much information that we have so many possibilities, it's really tough to clean and to filter and understand what, what's going to be useful and not, right? Sometimes technology, sometimes waste our time in, instead of saving. So technology uh, removed our privacy. So in the past, uh, people would talk to you on the phone, right? Nowadays, people send you a message and you can visualize the problem. So they delegate the problem, right? So technology has removed a bit of our privacy. And of course, we now have more work to do. Of course, we have more productivity and the more we produce, the more we are demanded. So we always work uh, with companies, top-notch companies, stressed, right? You always get stressed. So that's really tough to balance this. This is happening to me. I'm trying to prioritize my agenda, my schedule. And we have two reasons for that. The first one is that we are working with projects that we have never done before, right? In a con contingency mode. So we have many professions, professionals, thousands of professionals that have to work uh, remotely. So that's very, uh, really stressful, very complicated. And we have projects that lead to other projects. So nowadays, we, yeah, you can uh, resort to telemedicine. If you want to have an online meeting, you don't have to rent a room or something like that. So I think that we are working now. That's why we should prioritize. So now we can postpone activities. Por que na verdade vocês continuam, nós continuamos com as rotinas normais e a urgência exigiu de nós atividades paralelas, né? Então nós estamos aí com uma dupla jornada. Uh, we have a double journey. And Khalil, what about your routine? Olha, eu nunca tive rotina. Well, I have never had a routine. Mas o problema é que I would like to have one, but I can't because all the time I have a different project. I have software things on ATMs, and then I have to deliver a, a bride's dress, a wedding dress. So for me, it hasn't changed a lot because I was working from home already. To, it has been always my dream. I all I. <laughs> I my my dreams the house in Santorini the ICU bed and working from home and then my wife my children they started working from home also and this was the greatest change 
In the beginning, I was alone. Now I have more people. We had to change our internet plan. So, speaking of what Soraya was talking about, even Latin, because everyone thinks it's a dead language. It isn't. It's the, ofi the official language in Vatican, in the Vatican, the country. The Vatican has a modernization department of Latin. The Pope has to say everything in Latin, even technological terms. So someone has to invent a term from technological things in Latin. So there are different words, agriculture, worker, for example. And now they need to be interested in this modernization and how these new words can be used. Many of them are not so new anymore. And this is a particular matter. Many people wouldn't like to do it. People have the right to remain analog. The more immersed in technology I am, more I would like to go to the real world again, to be less technological, because this is an addiction. There are diseases related to these. No mobilephobia. If you do not have your cell phone, you have you are afraid, super afraid. Oh, a uh, ghost vibration you have to feel if you do not have your phone you feel a vibration on your pocket and the person that is beside you if you give more attention to your cell phone it's going to be a problem and we have to pay attention all the time we can have the world in our hands but on the other hand we are living on a physical space so this, there's no frontier uh, thing that we are talking about is view, beautiful, but in reality, this is not how it works because we are in our space time. We live here on a physical place. So ha balancing everything is the matter. How can we do it? How can we maintain the virtual and the real world is what we have to do. Fernando Pessoa used to say, the ideal, the ideal is to have a balance between the artificial and the natural. Yes, and we have a life made of choices. And we have to see what we want, what is going away and what is keeping. And now our last question, people at home, the Telegram group, do not use old maps to, to have new lands. Many people say about the new world. So what's left? What do you think is going to be deleted? And what is going to be kept from now on? What is going to be changed? What you personally will have to learn? Can I link what Khalil said and then I answer your question? Yeah. It is funny because we say about the analog a lot. And the, if I talk to my father, my father only can send voice messages in his cell phone. But he, is, he has a very technological cell phone. It is a reactive technology. And this message is sending from one cell phone to another. It's a cutting edge technology. If he, he was going to use the same resources in the 70s, he would say he was the most developed person on the planet. I attended to a lecture and the speaker told about it. At the time, we had to wait for an Uber for half an hour. Today, if you wait for five minutes, you cancel the Uber. 
So what's left here with the digital era? It's a new basis of what's analog. A, a person will send them a WhatsApp message, for example, and we use a baseline, but even the analogic person, she, is, she uses technology. We go from the basic, and even the most basic person uses technology. And this is what's going to be. I think that what's left is empathy and collaboration. This is what's cool about it. People having a purpose. We do not want red tape. This is something we do not want. You and you, Soraya, I think in the medicine field, what's going to remain is sharing information, our sharing information capacity. This is what happened to us. We can disseminate information. We still can have the flow better. It, can, it has to be adjusted. And now it was, uh, we were able to have the doctor going away uh, further, I mean. So these two different ends, they are closer. And we have to get better in taking care of many things, but people's interactions, it is something that is going to remain. We have to remember that we are not alone. And you, Khalil. I agree with all of you, especially what Leonardo said about empathy. This is a very important change. And I have seen reports from delivery people. They say that now they say hello to us. It was, it's a part of society that was invisible and now People pay attention to them because they realize how essential their service is. So many people pay, saw, realized this. Everyone is needed and people are realizing that. It is very important to look at the other and have the empathy. We have to wish well for everyone, independent of them, their political beliefs. It is a higher feeling that is going to be on people, and I hope so. Yes, this is very interesting because many values have changed. Technology is important, but person, people is what's most important. We are creative also. We have a question, Carlos Eli asked, with banks being automated, lots of machines, technology, do you think people will get more distance or will they will get closer to each other? Will the personal relationships be different with technology? What is going to happen to people? Oh, Khalil showed us in his animation, we have to choose. We can't go both ways. Many people are optimists about breaking the frontiers. But there's a part that's going to remain. And this phobia to stay home because of the pandemics is proof of this. Many people like to be away with other people. Now they are at home only with that family, that nuclear family, and now they're getting crazy. So, yeah, there's a parallel be between these two things. This can be changed. Yes, people want to live, to savor some food, to know new people, hear other languages. People are connected to the moment experience. And this is something with value. So what's happening now? the contact 
It's very complicated. It shows human beings' importance. Well, thank you all for being here, the panelists. I would like to thank Uninove, Glossa, Language Solutions, the interpretation. I would like to say thank you to Khalil, who is far away from us. 600 kilometers away from us. Tomorrow we will have more panels, case studies, digital series panels, Uninove, team panels, intelligent series, public management and KM, digital innovation, and also our case tracks. You are going to receive an email before, follow our programming, and afterwards everything will be available to you because it is recorded. I thank you so much for the participation. Thank you so much. Thank you.